This lecture covers Jackson and America, and we're focusing on the Jacksonian era here. The Jacksonian era is sometimes referred to as the era of the common man. It lasts from roughly 1820 to roughly 1840, depending on who you read, the dates may change a little bit. Typical characteristics of this era of the common man, or the Jacksonian era, the big thing is the, the loosening of voting restrictions, the fact that more people all of a sudden had the right to vote. The right to vote is, also, is sometimes referred to as suffrage, or it's sometimes referred to as the franchise. Either one of these, uh, if you see an increase in either one of these, it's talking about somebody else has the right to vote. As more people had the right to vote, interestingly enough, during this time, more people took advantage of that opportunity. And you had increasing numbers of people voting. Because of that, because you're increasing voter participation, you're including people who don't own property. You're lowering the age that uh, was required to, vote, to vote from 25 to 21. Because of that, the politicians start increasing their appeals to typical people, and so we'll see that they start using gimmicks and things. You also have this belief that the people need to be more involved in the day-to-day the -day operations of the party machine, the party politics. Ultimately, this whole era of the common man is symbolized by the election of Andrew Jackson. Question 1. What inferences about voting practices in the period 1800 to 1840 can you make from the maps and graph at the right? Be sure you copy the questions and answer these things on your own paper. Here's our first map, a map of 1800, uh, showing how the electors are chosen. You see the purple there, they're chosen by state legislatures. Uh, the green, they're chosen by popular election. And in the orange, they're chosen by districts within, within those states. You see how that changes from 1800 to 1824. All of a sudden in the green, where the people chose the electors, uh, you have a whole lot more states. Right? You have... In the orange, uh, states where the people by district choose the electors, and the purple, where they were still chosen by the state legislatures. This also sh this graph shows the percentage of the adult white males who were voting. And you see in 1824, only about 26-27% voted. By the time you get to 1840, we're almost at 80% of adult white males voting. Part of the increase is due to a uh, loosening of those voting restrictions. But uh, that doesn't account for all of it, especially from 1836 to 1840. So what was going on during those times? All right, let's talk about some elections here. The election of 1824 um, was ultimately decided by the House of Representatives. We've been over this in class. Uh, John Quincy Adams, despite coming in second in the Electoral College, uh, was made president by the House of Representatives. He then turned around and named Henry Clay Secretary of State. And remember, this is what Andrew Jackson referred to as the corrupt bargain. They, they had made a deal. John Quincy Adams had set Henry Clay up to be the next President of the United States. Question two. How were the elections of 1824 and 1828 reflective of the era of the common man? Four years later, in the election of 1828, uh, the Democratic-Republican Party had split, and that's a permanent split. They're never going to get back together. They split into the National Republicans, who nominated John Quincy Adams for a second term. This was the party of the old Federalist ideas. They liked the idea of a strong national government. They liked the idea of internal improvements. They liked the idea of government support for business and industry. They liked large tariffs. The other party are going to be the Democrats, and this is where today's Democratic Party traces its lineage, if you don't go all the way back to Thomas Jefferson. They nominate Andrew Jackson, and they're going to be the old Democratic-Republican ideas, the Jeffersonian ideas. They will say that they are the inheritors of Jefferson's plan for America, so they're opposed to a central bank. They're, they're supporters of states' rights. Basically, Everything the National Republicans aren't. They're, they are. 
this election is probably one of the nastiest elections in U.S. history. Even though it does have to do with issues, those issues on that previous slide, this election is also characterized by personal attacks. This is going to be even worse than the election of 1800 between Adams and Jefferson. Okay. We refer to some of this stuff as mudslinging. It's usually stuff the voters don't care for, but in the 1800s, uh, this stuff can be quite fun. Stuff that is said against John Quincy Adams uh, at some point will be rather boring and mundane. They accuse, they accuse him, of course, of that corrupt bargain with Henry Clay, stealing the presidency from Andrew Jackson in 1824. Uh, they charge him with being an elitist, working only for the upper class and the people with money. Uh, there are also accusations made against him that are very creative. At one point in his career, he is the ambassador to Russia. And while he was the ambassador to Russia, he, along with any other ambassador, would recruit young people from the United States to come and work in the American embassies, in their foreign countries. While he is the, amb the ambassador to Russia, the Tsar of Russia is known for fancying the young ladies. And so, Jackson's supporters will accuse Adams of recruiting young women, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, to go work in the embassy. And while they're working in the Russian embassy, he will introduce them to the Tsar of Russia, who will then take advantage of them because they're young and impressed by his power. And so, basically, they accuse him of uh, being a pimp for the Tsar of Russia. Stuff they say against Jackson is much more interesting, much more creative. Uh, he is accused of being nothing more than a common murderer. And to a certain extent, this is true. He had been in several duels. Dueling during this particular era and then the decades before is becoming illegal. States are making it illegal. And in at least one of the duels, Jackson and his opponent traveled five days just to get out of a state so that they could get into an area where dueling had not yet been made illegal just so Jackson could kill him. They start saying things about Jackson's mother. They actually accuse her of being a whore for the British Army. That she was brought over by the British to service their soldiers in the colonies. Jackson really took this very personally because uh, not only had his father died before the revolution, his mother had actually died in the revolution. One of her sons had been injured and had been evacuated to Charlestown. And she went to care for her wounded soldier son. And while she was caring for him, both he and uh, Jackson's mother fell victim to a plague, cholera, that was sweeping through the town. So basically... They are making this accusation against a woman who gave her life in service to the United States, in service to the Revolution. But it's nothing worse than what they say about Jackson's wife, Rachel. She is accused of bigamy. She is accused of being married to two men at the same time. In short, they call her a slut. Yeah. Rachel Jackson had married a man when she was very young, and it turned out he was a gambler and a drunk, and she had divorced him, or so she thought. And when she met Andrew Jackson, and they got married, several months later they found out that her original divorce was never finalized. And so, charges are leveled against Jackson. How can you trust this man's character when he is having an affair with an otherwise married woman? But this is the era of the common man. And to the common man, the stories about Jackson are much more interesting, they're much more fun, they're much more honest, and they're much more down to earth. And so Jackson is going to win. Okay. Wins in the popular vote, just over 640,000. The electoral vote, much clearer victory, 178 to Adams with only 83. But the results of this election are going to be personally devastating for Andrew Jackson. His wife, Rachel, sadly dies uh, about a month after the election. She dies uh, from a heart attack. 
which is brought on, the doctors determined, by stress, which was more than likely a result of what was said about her during the campaign. Jackson blames her death, then, on his opponents. And so one thing about Andrew Jackson, the political is very personal.